All right, so tonight's class is called Psych 202. So you've been with me for a little while. We're past Psych Class 101. So you've been with me for two years now, so you know how I think. And so I'm going to continue talking about past pains, breaking the chains that they started so well. But we're going to go a little bit deeper. So how many of you have heard this, or maybe you've said, the past is the past? All right, heard that, the past is the past. Well, that's not a true statement. And thank God it's not, because I would be unemployed. So, <laughs> really glad it's not true. But saying the past is the past is like saying gray is gray. It's a true statement. Gray is gray. But there are many shades of gray, right? How many shades of gray are there? Yeah, you sinners, I knew. <laughs> I uh, know. Woo! That's my girls right there. Women of the well. Women of the well in the corner. That's right. They're all sitting together. Every single one of y'all. Anyway. So it's not a completely true statement. What about this one? I hear this. I hear this a lot. There's no point talking about the past. I can't change it. Talking about it won't change it. I'm so grateful as a psychotherapist. That when patients come in and they say that to me, I can tell them, praise God, that's not true. And that while it is true that we can't change the events of the past, I can change through God how those events affect you today. So it's not a true statement. One more. How about this one? Something's holding you back. Something's holding you back. That's actually a true statement. And then when someone says, something's holding you back, something's keeping you from God's glory, something's keeping you from the next level, it's something from your past seriously pulling you back. So let's start right there. And those of you who have seen my handwriting know that it's special. <laughs> and I'm going to write anyway. Here's some doctor's handwriting for you. But we're going to start right with past pain and what that is. All right, so I'm going to give an example, okay? So let's just say last person picked for soccer when you're a kid or any event. All right, so a lot of our past pain does come from childhood. Not all of it. There can be some devastating events as an adult. But because childhood development means that you are developing, that's your first impression, your central nervous system is unblemished when you're a child. So when an event happens, it's, it's an imprint on you. And that's how you start to learn your interaction in life. So let's just go with this. So I want you to call out events that have happened to you that have caused pain. And again, it might not be something that happened to you. It might be something you don't want to happen to your child, something you heard about through someone else. But what are other events that cause pain from the past? Bullying, absolutely. What else? Molestation, absolutely. Abandonment. Being homeless. What other events can you think of? Divorce. Whether you're a child of divorce or you're an adult going through it, very, very difficult. Death, absolutely, death and grief. Absolutely, verbal abuse, domestic violence. Oh, I don't think anything could be even worse. Loss of child. All right, so these are all we can admit, these are painful. So any event that you go through, a belief is formed. And if the belief is not formed, it's reinforced. There's always a belief that happens. So a belief is something like, if let's just stick with this, I'm the last person picked for soccer. I now will believe I am unworthy. Or that I'm not good enough. That I'm too much or too little of something. I'll go through some of these things and think that I'm unlovable. Right? 
that something's wrong with me. So if I'm eight years old and any of these happen to me, but let's just say that I'm the last person picked for soccer and I now believe that I'm unworthy, that something's wrong with me, I have no container for that. It's too big for me. I can't walk around feeling this, and so I have to have something, some behavior that covers what I believe. And that is where the chains come from. And for me, it was alcohol. E2H means alcohol, so you know. For me, it was alcoholism. For Sean, it was alcoholism. What are other chains? What are other things that we do to cover up our pain? Toxic relationships, love addiction. Absolutely, that's a huge one. Oops. Isolation. Gambling. Porn, sex addiction. Was that? Absolutely. I, I missed something. Codependency. Huge one from Nanji in the back. <laughs> Coda bear. Codependency. People pleasing. Absolutely. Because again, I, I can't, when I have an event like this and I now believe something's wrong with me, I can't feel that every day. I have to have behavior to cover that up, to stop feeling that. Everything that's listened to this belief, all this is a definition for shame. And we all know how shame came into the world. We know that Adam and Eve were in the, the garden and life was blissful. It was perfect. And the enemy came to Eve and told her, you need more. You're not enough as you are. You need something else. And he showed her behavior so she could feel more than she was already feeling. This is shame. And so when you have this type of shame and you're experiencing this, we develop some type of behavior. This is shameful behavior, but we're doing it trying to cover up the pain. And I want you to know, it's not the event that will trip you up in life. The event doesn't chain you to the past. It's the belief. It's believing that you're less than. It's believing that something's wrong with you. And one thing that's not up here that I want to add is perception. All of these are children of shame, and so is perception. Perception is when we get so involved in how people think about us, how people view us. So what I want you to do, you should have got a, a note sheet when you came in. For the number one thing on there, for number one, I want you to answer this question. No one's going to see your answer unless you have somebody beside you that cheats. No one's going to see it. So I want you to put what comes to mind first. The number one way that I want people to perceive me is blank. What's the most important way you want people to perceive you as? How do you want to be perceived? Number two, whatever comes to mind first, the number one way you do not want to be perceived. Okay, so I'm going to give you my answers. The number one way that I want you to perceive me is as a godly, confident woman. I want you to know where I've been and know there's no way I could be here without him, that I am drawing on his confidence, that there's no reason that I should be this content in life without knowing how my father views me. I'm a godly, confident woman. The way I don't want you to perceive me as so I don't want you to perceive me as unattractive that is a huge contradiction what is that let me explain it the best way I can why they contradict each other so much okay so in the world of psychology we teach people that there's four parts of self I'm going to demonstrate this for you this is your God self this is your adult self it's a clear chair now I teach people 
To know if you're being an adult is you see words. It means you're clear, concise, congruent, Christ-centered, creative. That's your God self. That's where we're meant to live right here as an adult. This, this is that critical parent inside of you. That voice. It's a shame voice. I've never met anyone who doesn't have that voice. I meet people who think it's their voice. I need you to know it's not. It came from the outside in. It's a learned behavior. It's not you. But you'll think it's you, and that's what the enemy wants you to think. But this is the voice that tells you, you talk too much. You didn't talk enough. You should have gone to the party. Why didn't you stay home? Nobody wanted to see you there in the first place. You should go to Bible study. You should pray out loud. You pray too long. That voice, that's what this chair is. This chair, the one that our preacher Naeem uses the most, this is the teenager's chair. Perfect. This is the chair of instant gratification. This is the teenager inside of you. This chair is all that behavior. This chair says, I, I don't care what's going on. I, I can take away your pain. I, I got you. I can get you doing porn. I can get you to drink. I can do whatever I can, but you don't need to feel anything. I got, I got you. This chair is a wounded child inside of you. And some of you, particularly men, would say, there's no wounding inside of me. Uh, okay, ask your wife. But everyone has a wounded child. And I'll tell you partly how I know this, because this has so much to do with your shame. For most people, shame enters your life when you're about eight years old. That's when it starts becoming about feeling like something's wrong with you, having to prove your worth. By the age of 11, it is full-fledged. That's why in about middle school, the kids you play with your whole life that you got along with, now, because they don't want to be perceived as uncool, won't talk to you because you're not wearing Hollister. Because so many of us have a wounded child inside of us. So this is where I need to be. So I can tell you, I'm right here. I'm a godly, confident woman. I know the Lord, the creator of the whole world, loves me. You can't mess with me. I've got him. And then Cindy walks by, and all she has to say is, Kim, did you get your hair cut? <laughs> yeah. That's all it takes because of my wounding, because of my belief. I can become a five-year-old little girl really, really quickly. And if I stay here long enough, the teenager tells me what to do next. Because see, guess what? I know this voice is coming. I know the critical voice is coming. I've heard it all my life in so many different forms. So when that comes and I feel like this, behavior takes over. And I'll be in any chair but his. We get so consumed by how someone perceives us. We're so concerned that we don't want people to see our past pain that we'll put money, time, and effort to covering up our past pain so that you'll perceive me as a good mom, as a good person, as attractive as anything but someone who is wounded. But God tells us in Romans 2.11, he tells us, God pays no attention to what others think about you. He doesn't care how someone perceives you. It doesn't matter to him. And on top of that, he doesn't even care what you think about yourself. Because guess what? He made up his own mind. He's known you since conception. He loves you. He's got you. And so what you think of you doesn't matter. What other people think of you doesn't matter to him because he made up his mind about you at conception. He owns you. You belong to him. See, the enemy wants to lie to you like Elizabeth talked about. We're told in John 8, and John 10 so clearly that the enemy is a liar. There's no truth in his character. He came here to distract you. He came here to destruct and to steal from you. Because if you're so worried about how people receive you and covering up your past pain or living out that pain, then you're not standing right here where God has made up his mind about you and truth prevails. Proverbs 18, 21 tells us, Now speak the bolded declarations out loud. 
to yourself. You know what it means to declare? Declare, it means you make known truth despite the contradictions. See, the world will tell me I'm all of this. This is all I'm ever going to be. When it's a bold declaration, and I tell, when I decide who I am truthfully, and I tell myself who I am, who God says I am, life changes, it becomes truth. And I need to tell you that in the beginning of my sobriety, I couldn't tell myself, I, I understand a bold declaration is saying, I can do all things through Christ. That didn't work for me. You know what I had to say to all these voices? You are wrong. It's the best I could do. You are wrong. I had to know that I knew God's word, and I didn't believe it yet, but I knew one day I would. So I had to tell the voice, you are wrong. Scripture tells us that the power of life and death is in your tongue. So it's vital that you only allow the truth to come out of your mouth. See, I don't care what you think. People talk all the time about you are your thoughts. It's really not true. You are what you believe. People can say all the time what their thoughts are, and they, they think they need a good life, and they think they deserve a good job, and they can say good things about themselves, but they believe that they're unworthy. And their behavior will show it. We have to know what we believe and speak truth, what God says, his word, who he says we are. We are what we believe. And the difference is between what causes either an amazing life or a life of disappointment. These three chairs, when I vacillate between them, and this is where I live, and I did it for such a long time, that's a life of disappointment. This, this life is an amazing life. A life of godly confidence. There's a woman here tonight. She's right there. Her name is Judy Quickle. We all know and love Judy. And I was talking to Judy recently, and, and Judy told me that she was teaching an, an art lesson to a little girl named Skylar. And Skylar would draw the picture, and then she would scribble out part of it. And Judy said, why, why are you scribbling out stuff? And Skylar said, because it's not perfect, and I'm irritated. And Judy said, well, you... You can scribble it out, but I need you to know when you scribble out your artwork, you're scribbling out a piece of you, that you are an extension on that page, and you're taking away something that you created, and what you create is beautiful. I said, Judy, that's the smartest thing you've ever said. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's our Heavenly Father. That's, that's a beautiful statement. And her sharing that story with me and how she handled this little girl reminded me of a painting that I did when I was a little girl. And I remember my dad came home and he, he picked up the painting and he looked at it. And he said, can I have this? I said, sure, daddy. And he took this painting and it's right there. There's a picture of it. He took this and he framed it. And he took it to his office and he put it on the wall. And if you ask me, it looks like I walked in the house drunk and kicked over a bunch of paint cans and it just splattered all over a poster board. But not to my daddy. To him, he saw something beautiful and amazing. And so he took it, and he framed it, and he put it on his wall. And I'm not exaggerating. Over the years, so many people have come to him and offered him money for that painting. And when he says, he said, you can't have that. My little girl created that, and it's priceless. You can't have what she created. See, I see something pathetic. He sees something beautiful, and that's, that's our Heavenly Father. Because what we perceive doesn't matter. It's what God sees. See, when God sees you, he sees you as his child. See what kind of love the Father has given us so that we should be called children of God, and so we are. He calls you his heir. And if Children, then heirs, heirs of God and heirs with Christ. 
He calls you redeemed. In him, we have redemption through the blood of Jesus. He calls you a new creation. Therefore, anyone that is in him, in Christ, is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new is here. God, your Father, calls you an heir, redeemed, a new creation, blameless, holy. He calls you his. You are his masterpiece. You are his work of art. And he took you and he framed you and he put you on the wall. And when addiction comes by and tries to scribble out a piece of you, when shame comes by and tries to tell you who you are, God says, no, you can't devalue what I created, that she is priceless, that he is priceless, that you, a work of art, are bought and paid for. You are his. Let tonight be the night that if there's any shame left in you, if you're so concerned how people perceive you instead of who God says you are, that you leave that here. Someone asked that when we, or Jordan is singing, if God has put something on your heart tonight, I want you to walk over to that cross. There's post-it notes there, and I want you to write down the shame the perception, the chain, whatever it is that's holding you back, that no more of that. Satan doesn't get a grip on you anymore today because you know who created you. And he's already made up his mind about you. 